Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So um, we are here to discuss Kamini Dantapani's new book, Raja Raja Chola. I have my copy right here. So Kamini, I noticed while I was reading this that this is such a prodigiously researched book. There are, you know, many pages of citations. And I think you have looked at both popular historians like Nilakantan Shastri as well as, you know, more academic sources like Leslie Orr and so on. And um, the other thing that I noticed is that even with the sheer effort that has gone in and the care with which you have written this, it still sort of wears its research lightly. It's a very well-written book. And, you know, in that sense, it's a difficult line to walk. And I think you've done that really well. Thank you. Um, another thing that I noticed is that this book is called Raja Raja Chola. I mean, you know, named after the most famous Chola, the banner king of the Cholas, as one would say. But um, it actually spans a much larger period, right? It starts from the Sangam Cholas of the 4th century BC. And I think it goes on past Raja Raja and Rajendra in the 900s and well into the twilight of the empire in the 1200s and so on. So the sheer amount of work it took to, to you know, write a book that spans this entire period of the Chola dynasty. Um, so I would start with a slightly personal question. Why choose the Cholas? Why did you like want to write about them? Is it because um, were you connecting with you know, your region's history or something? Or was it that you saw that there was a missing piece in Chola history that you wanted to fill? First of all, thank you for your kind words and thank you all for coming. And I guess I would answer your question with a question, which is why not the Cholas? Um, you know, they're such a remarkable dynasty and uh, there's been a paucity of uh, literature on them, uh, good writing on them. So, but also it was, the topic was handed to me on a platter actually. The publisher, Aleph, approached me and asked me, if I would write a layperson's history of the Cholas. And I said, why me? I'm not a historian, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a scholar. And they said, that is precisely why we are asking you, because we want a book that would appeal to the, the lay reader, but that is also heavily researched. So um, that was my mandate, and that's what I tried to do. And yes, it was also fulfilling filling a gap that I think is there in history writing in India. There isn't very much on the southern dynasties, unfortunately. You know, So either in our school curriculum or even out there, although that is changing your own book, you know, is uh, historical fiction on the Cholas. There's great historical fictions. There's great history being written now. But growing up, I simply did not have, uh, you know, access to what the kind of history I'd like to read today. So I kind of set out to do that. They asked me to do it, and I said, OK, I will, after some initial reluctance. And uh, I hope this fills a gap. <laughs> so um, this is your first book, right? Yes. Your debut book, in a way. So I'm curious, since you call yourself a layperson lay writing about history, what was the process? How much time did this take you, considering the time period that we're talking about? And the fact that a lot of the sources are fairly obscure. Yes. A lot of the inscriptions are in, you know, a dialect of Tamil that most people no longer speak at this point. Exactly. And so on. The process was not a pretty one. It was messy. And I think the whole thing took a little over four years to complete the research and the writing. And I spent the first year kind of just flailing about. I had no idea where to start. I really did not know. I just kept going down multiple rabbit holes, which are actually not a waste. Many of them led nowhere, but they kind of each one opens your you know, mind to something new. And uh, even if it doesn't actually make its way into the book, it kind of uh, gives you a couple of ideas of what, where next to go. Was there a particular writer that, you know? Uh, yes. A... So my foundation stone was Neela Kantashastri's The Cholas. That is a remarkable book, but it is about 80 years old at this point. I mean, he's covered everything, you know, the, the, the history, the society, the religion, the, you know, the trade, the organization. It's all there, but it's not the most readable of books. And it is also, as I said, over 80 years old. So I started with that. There is a whole lot of academic, scholarly, very boring um, work on you know different aspects. So there's stuff on Chola trade, Chola organization, the bronzes, the Brihadishwara temple, the military campaigns, all that. So I read through all of that. And yes, a lot of it is obscure, but thank goodness for the internet. <laughs> I don't know where I would be without that because a lot of stuff is digitized and available for free, translated 
into English. So, I mean, even if you don't know the Tamil of those days, you are at a disadvantage, but it's not as much of a disadvantage as you think you would be. So it was a real steep learning curve for me. And I think I appreciate the process too, because I started on a blank slate. I had no preconceptions, no ideas. So for me, everything was like an aha, aha. And you know, it was an exciting discovery. And uh, I think that's a nice way to go about things, you know, without uh, having this head full of existing ideas. Everything was learned anew, and um, uh, yeah, it was. A, it took about four years, and it was a lot of work, but ultimately, it was rewarding. And that is a lot. <laughs> um, and speaking of the internet, I remember when I was researching the Cholas, there is this uh, blog by this single person. I don't know if you came across it. She's done the in translation of the entire Sangam. Oh my poetry. God! By the he. Yes, by the he. Yeah. Yes. So she's done yes. it in a blog, and yes. it's like openly accessible and searchable and Absolutely. a labor of love. Yeah. I mean, we done. like to put down blogs and things, but there's some outstanding blogs out there. In fact, I used hers, Vaidehi Herbert's blog extensively for my chapter on the Sangam literature and Sangam poems. So, yeah. Um, so, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is that the Cholas are a great comeback story, right? So, like, it's interesting to me, they're a little bit shape-shifting in the sense that in the Sangam era, they are just these embattled chieftains protecting, you know, small turfs and constantly fighting their neighbors. Yes. And then, after a long period of time, they suddenly come back and build themselves into, you know, one of the most powerful kingdoms of their time. So, what do you think uh, was, what do you think drove this clawback, in a sense, of a dynasty from virtual obscurity back to power. Yeah, so that's the fascinating Chola story. So the Cholas are among the few empires in the world that had like two periods of, I guess you could call it power. So the first were the Ch Sangam Cholas who were there about 2000 years ago. And as she said, there were little, there were a small local clan, you know, in little towns around the Kaveri Delta, just fighting the whole time they were fighting with other little clans. And, uh, but at the same time, they were involved in trade with the Greek and Roman worlds, and their cities were apparently prosperous from the poetry and stuff that was written about them. Sangam poetry was written in those times. And then suddenly we hear nothing of them, and they kind of fade away into the darkness. And a few centuries later, they kind of come alive again. And it's a very slow and unsteady and unstable and zigzaggy rise to power. You know, it was not this like grand sweep into the pages of history or something like that. So there was one chieftain who won, uh, I guess, a crucial battle against another. That was, his name was Vijayalaya, and he's considered the founder of the imperial Chola line. And that's a name that, again, some historians like to use. Some historians dislike that word. But he set in motion the return to power of, of the Cholas. And it was battling. It was, I like to call it a game of snakes and ladders because, you know, they kept going up, sliding down, up, down, up, down, lots of instability. But slowly but surely, they began to push out of their core territory, which was around the Kaveri River Delta. And they started conquering the lands that belonged to other major powers, like the Pallavas in the north, and their great enemies, the Pandyas in the south. They came here to the Deccan region, uh, Mysore, Bangalore, and further around. And the emperor who really got that process started was Raja Raja. You know, so he just methodically uh, attacked in all directions, expanded the empire beyond where it had, uh, into places it had never been to before. And, uh, you know, consolidated power and at the same time concentrated on so many other things like the temple and the bronzes and the trade and the organization and everything. So it's a fascinating story of uh, clawing to power. But at the same time, they could never kind of sit back and say, ah, it's done, you know. And uh, throughout, from the beginning to the end, it was up and down, up and down with, you know, few steady-ish periods when... You mentioned an up and down, but I'm wondering if um, Raja Raja Chola, was there a pivotal battle that sort of helped him change the course? The Ceylon one, for example, or maybe the you know battle for Vengi or something else. Was there something significant that helped turn the tide? It was not, I wouldn't say one 
significant battle, but a series of them. And surely word spread, spread. So his attack of Sri Lanka came, you know, early ish in his career, and it was brutal. It was really, if you read the Sri Lankan accounts of his attack there, he burnt everything, he ra he, he raided and looted the, the the stupas and brought a lot of you know wealth back into his kingdom a lot of which was used to fund the Brihadishwara temple. Yes, the Deccan campaigns. So I guess every great king needs a rival, has a great rival who kind of uh, matches him across many areas. So Rajaraja's rival was a Chalukya king called Satyashraya from, from the Deccan. And they were evenly matched along many areas. Some of the most violent battles were fought in the Deccan. And if there's a turning point, I would say yes. His victory in the Deccan was definitely one uh, that brought all the territory that had never been, you know, anywhere near Chola territory into his fold. And then also the eastern Deccan, the Vengi uh, area around present-day Andhra Pradesh became his. He created some strategic alliances with some princes there, got his daughter married to one of the princes, and that set in motion a very interesting you know, set of events that uh, had consequences far down the road. The Pandyas were again a major, 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 major thorn in the side throughout the years of Chola rule. He conquered them and... Uh, Yes, they were the arch villains. <laughs> so it's funny, when I was researching this book, I went to Madurai for something, and I felt I was going into enemy territory. You know? <laughs> it's like that, that's, it was a funny feeling. So uh, yeah, so he kind of conquered them as well. So it was a series of pivotal battles, and uh, I think he did it strategically also. So you know, very methodically, he set out. And it's very interesting. When you read the book, you find a sense of that they were very few very short peaceful periods in the Deccan Plateau, right? Yes, yes. The, the fights were intense, ongoing and continuous. Why do you think it was so heavily divided and so divisive, this region, for much of its like ancient history? Uh, yeah, the stakes, I guess, were very, very high. So these were very unstable times in, I guess, all of India and definitely in southern India. And it was the first time that I think these kind of so-called empires were coming into being. They saw the possibilities of expanding beyond, beyond their borders. Maybe the kind of warfare that they did with elephants and horses. Horses started coming into the picture. So they were able to fight, I guess, on a bigger and most, more organized scale. Um, uh, yeah, so... So the, the import of animals for the use of war. Yeah, basically. that, that was definitely horses came from the Arabian world. And they were used in, in battles too. We have inscriptions on uh, engravings on tem temple walls showing you know, scenes from battles with elephants and horses. And uh, so they, they were all commanded. I don't think they fought at this level er earlier on. So you know, the stakes were bigger, the battles were bigger. Okay. So you refer, you refer to trade just now in the context of war. And you know, when we learn about Indian history, it's from a very domestic perspective, right? We, look inward, we talk about uh, kingdoms like they're very domestic concerns, but the Cholas, especially under Raja Raja and Rajendra Chola, you give a sense of them being extremely outward looking, right? In terms of the maritime trade of the period and their willingness to trade with the Fatimids, the Song China and so on. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about that relationship and how, I guess there was a lot at stake, which is why they Yes. like captured key ports and you know the key coastlines and so on yeah exactly i found that fascinating because you know you think rajaraja was so busy fighting you know so many domestic battles he wouldn't have the bandwidth to think of anything more than that but he had his you know sites trained well beyond the chola borders so they had spies going back and forth they had traders going back and forth they had sources of information they, they obviously didn't have google and things like that but they made use of information in a way that i found was fascinating so when rajaraja came to power a new like a new trade dynamic was also coming into power in china you had the song dynasty which decided to make itself a maritime power and gave lots of trading benefits to those who were its fa uh, favored trading partners. And the Fatimids in Egypt were also coming to power. So there was this very, very brisk, strong uh, maritime trade between those worlds, between the Fatimids in the west and, and China in the east. And we had our Cholas bang in the middle. 
So their ports were important, you know, way stations, stopping off stations for, uh, you know, loading, unloading. If the monsoons wind, wind uh, were, were bad, they had to stop there. So there was a lot of money to be made there. They collected taxes. They collected taxes, days. exactly. So capturing, you know, being a part of uh, that trade meant a huge source of money. There's only so much you can keep, you know, fighting battles and getting loot from that. But this is a more, I guess, rewarding way of making money. So the big rivals to the Cholas in this were the Sri Vijaya Kingdom to the east in Indonesia. So it's very interesting the kind of double-faced diplomacy that took place. You know, on the one hand, each one was trying to stab the other in the back because they both wanted a big piece of the Chinese pie. And at the same time, they pretended to be friendly with each other. So uh, it was a very, very, very interesting situation. And uh, Rajaraja actually sent a trade delegation to China, a ship with about 50 people laden with tributes, pearls, frankincense, perfumes, uh, fine uh, you know, cloths and stuff like that. So it went to China, it took over three years to reach China. And they were received very well by the court, the Song court. And, um, you know, they scattered pearls in front of the Chinese emperor. And they read out this letter that Rajaraja had written that I found very funny. It says, Rajaraja says of himself, I'm like a small mosquito from a barbarous town. And it embarrasses me to, you know, pay tribute to somebody as grand and as great as you are. But please accept this humble tribute. And here you have Rajaraja back home with the most grandiose titles, you know, jewel of the Cholas, lion of this, and slayer of the Pandyas. And he's calling himself a little mosquito from a barbarous town. So uh, I don't know if this is how diplomacy worked. Or uh, this was actually the Chinese account. They wrote this way. So whether they were having the last laugh and, you know, inventing stuff. But it all gives you a picture of a very dynamic life in those times, you know. So, uh, but unfortunately, Rajaraja died uh, before his, his men reached China. So he never found out what happened there. But he was a far-reaching man, yes, a far-thinking man, thinking well, well, well beyond his, you know, little world of squabbles uh, in, in, in his immediate vicinity. So. And he sort of laid the foundation for Rajendra to build yes. a more... Um, international empire, we would call it, exactly. for example? Yes. So Rajendra was Rajaraja's son, and he had very, very, very big shoes to fill. So Rajaraja had done things that no Chola empire, no southern empire had done, uh, emperor had done before. So I think he was determined to outdo his father in many ways, and he had to do something really crazy to outdo what Rajaraja did, because Rajaraja had done so much. So he sent an expedition all the way up north to bring back boatloads of the Ganga River. He built a new capital. He built his own new temple. And then he launched a savage rage, uh, uh, raids on the kingdoms of Southeast Asia because, again, they were kind of interfering in the trade battle. They were telling the Chinese, oh, these Cholas are nothing important. Don't bother about them. Give us favor trading rights. So I think Rajendra had enough, and he launched a savage rage to uh, raid to uh, teach them a lesson but they were never really part of the chola empire it was more like they were the vassals so they continued having their own emperors and things like that but they were under a tight leash and they were they just had to obey whatever rajendra told them so so it wasn't an extractive relationship like the for example colonial empire it was basically more about um, agreeing to a set of rules and control? Yes. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't say it wasn't extractive. So if you had a state as a vassal state, you had to, you know, basically you had to give up all your rights to your so-called master. So I think it was probably extractive in some ways. They gave their uh, daughters as brides to the Cholas or to whoever the higher power was. This was one way of securing loyalty and saying, okay, please don't attack us. Our daughter is married to you. That was a very, again, a common strategy. The poor woman was you know, sent off somewhere and as a pawn in this big geopolitical game. Um, but they were also involved in the workings of the kingdom. So yes, I guess, you know, they were allowed to contribute to the temple and those contributions were acknowledged and appreciated. Yeah, so, and I guess they were organized and maybe for a while at least the fighting stopped and as long as there was peace, they could relax a little bit, one hopes. So. 
So um, I found it very interesting that when you were talking about Raja Raja, there seems to be a deliberate blurring that he did between God and himself, right? And essentially he represented God on earth yes. in his own narrative. And during these temple processions, both the bronzes of the gods as well as the bronzes of the royal family were taken out, yes. almost as if they had equal standing yes. and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm interested in whether, you know, this was one way for him to build legitimacy in essentially an empire that had no representation or democracy in terms of, you know, how they chose their king. And how did he go about that? He seemed to have made the temple also very central to the local economy. Absolutely. He seemed to have done a fair amount of innovative thinking in this direction, in terms of consolidating his own name, you know, with the people for a fairly disparate territory that he had conquered very fast, actually. You said it beautifully, actually. So that is right. I am sure that Raja Raja was a very devout and spiritual man. But yes, he wanted to portray himself as this ideal God King who's come and, you know, dispensing justice and peace and prosperity in his kingdom. And as you said, he had conquered territory that had never been part of the Chola kingdom before. You know, he had the Pallavas, the loathed Pandyas, the Chalukyas. They worshipped differently. They probably spoke different languages. They had different rituals, different way of life. So how do you kind of integrate them into under one so-called crown? And I'm sure many of them were not happy with, you know, being Chola vassals or something like that. So here is where I feel Rajaraja's brilliance shows. He built a temple the likes of which had never been seen in India before. This was the Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur. It was the biggest, tallest structure in India, they say, at the time. Till then, all the temples were very small. They were one story or two stories high, uh, very local in there. This, they belonged to that particular village. They had a very deep religious association with the Bhakti saints, the Nayanmas and Arvars who had gone through those villages singing about the, you know, uh, the gods in those temples. So it, it was very meaningful for the people of that temple, uh, of that village, sorry. But somebody from another village would not probably have that close an association with the tem uh, temple of another village. Whereas the Brihadishwara was built, it was a total blank slate, you know, there was no prior religious association of any kind. And he involved the entire kingdom, as you said, in, in its workings. And it was like, it was meant to make the people feel proud and say, look, your emperor has built this great thing. No other emperor has built anything of the sort. And you, you are willing to, you know, partake of the ritual life and you're, you're, you're able, you should, uh, you know, donate to it and your name will be inscribed on the walls and they, they were, you know, ap appreciated for that. And, if and any, a massive temple economy, right? There was a massive temple economy, exactly. So villages from around the kingdom, or from as far away as Sri Lanka, you know, Andhra, these, these parts of India, contributed their uh, uh, revenues, a certain portion of their revenues to the temple and it was considered a, a, a kind of a sign of prestige to do so. And it sat on so much of cash, it was like a bank, you know, so it was lending out money at 12.5% interest rate. So it was not merely a religious hub, but an economic hub, a cultural hub, a social hub of of the entire Chola kingdom. And he was smart that he picked a temple to do this because that was the most important social institution in southern India at the time. So and they were lenders also, right? Yes. They gave out loans. The a absolutely. So it was a thriving you, economy, actually. Do you know at all what the interest rate was? 12.5 percent, it says. So everything was uh, quite usurious, I think. So inscribed on the walls of the temples. We know all this because he was a meticulous recorder of everything. So everything that he did, how he built the temple, why he did it, what the ritual life was about, what the functions were about, who worked there, what the positions were, what their salaries were, what the rate of money lending was, everything was recorded on the walls of this temple. So I feel he was a man with a sense of history also, you know. So. Very interesting. So a living document, yes, basically, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Although it wasn't found out, they were not able to decipher it until several centuries later. It's kind of sad because Rajendra himself came about, came and swept his father's temple aside almost and he built his own temple about 60 kilometers away and 
the Chola capital moved there to Gange Konda Cholapuram, which Rajendra founded, and the worship also moved to the temple there. So Rajendra was it, saying something there, you know, it's like he wanted to step out of his father's shadow, and these are all actions of a man who wanted to prove himself to the world. And <laughs> so I also wanted to ask you about the role of um, women in Chola society. So there are three aspects here, right? You talk about the royal women like Sembi and Mahadevi and Kundavai. Yes. And you also mention the temple women. And then there are the ordinary women, yes. obviously. Mm -hmm. And in, in, a, in a society that was so highly patriarchal and so hero-driven, as you call it, what kind of jockeying did women manage in such a, um, you know, environment? Yeah. So actually, I do have a whole chapter about the life of women in Chola times. And I don't want to give the impression that they had it great and that they were, you know, um, completely empowered or anything like that. Because I think the life of women anytime, anywhere is a very mixed bag. So you have you have the gamut, you know. So, but you did have some very powerful women who had a powerful impact across many areas of Chola life. And again, the inscriptions are what give us this information. So there was one queen called Sembian Mahadevi who was the queen of an earlier Chola emperor. And he was a bit of a sad case, her husband. I mean, he was like what they call in Tamil, a pavam, like just not suited for the rigors of fighting and uh, uh, war and stuff like that, just very devout. So either he abdicated his throne or he committed suicide or he just went away, we don't know. And poor Sembe Mahadevi was left there, his wife. And in most cases, a woman, a widow, who was, uh, you know, whose husband was a king, her life is finished. You know, she has no hope of having any impact. But she did. I mean, she, she continued living through the lives of five emperors. She commissioned a bunch of temples. And as I said, a temple was a very important institution in South India, not, not merely for, for worship, but across many areas. So she understood that. And she left meticulous records about how these temples should be run. And she also has given inscriptions about agriculture and, and irrigation. So she had a very practical intelligence as well. And it is said that Rajaraja respected her so much that he gave any orders that she gave equal weight to his own. Again, that, that is inscribed there. So she was a remarkable woman. Her own idol, her own statue was taken out in procession in her time which was done only to the gods and the king. And uh, so for a widowed queen who uh, has no status to be given that kind of uh, power meant that she must have been a very, very strong and remarkable personality. And then you have Rajaraja's sister, Kundabai, who's also been, her inscriptions are all over the place. She has given money to temples, to hospitals, to uh, places of worship belonging to other religions, like uh, Jain uh, dispensary. And, and a Vaishnavite temple. So these women had agency, they had power. Then you had the women working in, in the temples. Rajaraja got 400 women from around his kingdom to work at his temple. They were given a salary, and you'll be happy to hear that their salary was on par with that with many of the male workers. Sometimes it exceeded that of the men, you know? So there was no, yeah, there was no sort of differentiation uh, that between the men and women in terms of their salary. We're not certain what they did, but it was a great deal of prestige that was uh, conferred on them to be a part of the temple. Then you had the palace women. You have a lot of inscriptions by women on temple walls where they're donating you know, either money or gold or, or ritual items to a temple. And the inscriptions are largely in their own name. You know, they, it will not say that she's a wife of so-and-so or the sister of so-and-so, but just in her own name. So, that's nice. And I think this sort of thing was at its height during Rajaraja and Rajendra's reign. And then it kind of diminishes. The, uh, you hear less of the women after that. Or they're kind of piggybacked onto some man and say she's a wife or so and so. so. But in his time, I think they did have agency and a voice. That strikes home, you know, because a friend, a friend was recently complaining about a passport application form, I think, oh. where... You're supposed to write husband's yes. name. And she was like, why do they need husband's name? Husband why can I stand on my own identity <laughs> yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, so yeah. that's basically what you're referring to exactly. as far as the inscriptions. Exactly, yeah. The men don't have to say they're the husband of so-and-so <laughs> or anything like that. So, 
Okay. And uh, I think Sembian Mahadevi was the one who popularized the dancing Shiva that we see even now, right? Yes. Across Tamil Nadu. Yes. So she was an innovator. What we think of today as a Chola temple style kind of came into being under her, you know. So she kind of developed niches in temple walls where she put up statues of Nataraja. And Nataraja was a god in the temple at Chidambaram, which has a very long and very fascinating history. But the Cholas kind of associated themselves with that deity. So Nataraja became kind of the state deity. It's a form of Shiva that was very popular in, in Chola times. And it was Sembian Mahadevi who kind of started that, that trend. And um, yeah, and also bronze images, they really, she sponsored some amazingly, some of the most beautiful Chola bronzes were made under her patronage, actually. So she demanded high standards. There were bronze, I guess you could call them workshops, in which these uh, images were made and used for taking out in procession. And some of the most beautiful ones were done under her patronage. I and mean, she's the one who sponsored it, and she gave her name to it. So I like to imagine her as a woman with high standards. She probably demanded you know, perfection and got it. And, so um, I wanted to talk to you about a very interesting nugget in your book about these elected councils yes. in Raja Raja's time. Because democracy is presented to us even in history as very much a Western innovation pioneered by the Greeks. But we know that it was consistently there in ancient times. It popped up and would disappear yes. and yes. so on. So I wanted to ask you, was this consistent across the territories that Raja Raja controlled? And how long did it last? And why do these things keep dying out? I think that's a very pertinent question. It is a pertinent question. <laughs> for us now, I suppose. So actually, what you talk about was there even before Raja Raja's time. So these are like, the Chola empire was a collection. It was an agrarian empire to begin with. So it's a collection of many, many, many villages each of which had its own, I guess you could call it a panchayat, like a village council that was elected by the members of that village. And the process was pretty remarkable. So you have um, inscriptions again, again on temple walls that describe exactly how this election took place. So the, unfortunately, it was only men who were allowed to stand for election, unsurprisingly, I guess. So they had to be between the ages of 30 and 70. They had to be of impeccable moral character. So if they had any criminal record of any kind or if their family member had any criminal record of any kind, they were not allowed to participate. But other than that, they put their hat in the ring. Quite literally, they put their name on a palm leaf and it was put into a big pot, apparently. And uh, you know, they were selected from that. Every person got to run for a year. So they made sure that every eligible man in the village got a turn at being in the committee. You know, so there were committees to manage the, the temple tanks. There were temp, uh, committees to ma manage, uh, you know, agriculture, irrigation, uh, all sorts of everything that you think of is there in the life of a village was managed by this democratically elected people. And it was there before Raja Raja's time. And I think it continues to some shape or form in the villages to this day. You have the village panchayat with a village elder and people kind of uh, selecting them. You think that's from these days? I think it is from these days, yes. They say some of this was there even from Sangam times, you know, this uh, equitable selecting of, of people and, uh, yeah. They should have kept some of these rules of, you know, your family member can't, like, stand for election if yeah. you are a shady yeah, character. Yeah, they made sure nepotism was, you know, yeah, kept because, to a minimum. Because now a politician goes to jail the wife or the kid or whoever you will go. run for the same seat, right? <laughs> exactly. So. Yeah, I know, I know. So if you had any, as I said, any kind of mark on your record, that was it. You, you could not. And your wife couldn't or your son or your brother couldn't do it either. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so um, I'm curious because you talk a lot also about the twilight years of the Cholas, right? So how do you think an empire dies? Is it overreach or is it something else? I think you said it. It's probably overreach. So the Cholas in the end became, I think, victims of their own success. So they were so, you know, uh, large that it is impossible to keep control over such a big and diverse empire. You know, you, the, uh, Raja Raja especially, he, he managed to do it. He had like people watching all over. 
But as I said, many of these were not happy about being, the Pandyas definitely were not happy about being under uh, Chola rule. And there were constant fighting going on, so the attention was diverted from you know, administering to fighting a lot of the time. At one point, it became so bloated. The bureaucracy was so bloated. There were so many you know, pop-up rebellions everywhere that it just kind of imploded. And, uh, and you have a weak emperor or two in the middle of that. Some of the later Chola emperors towards the end were nothing, you know, they were, one of them just sat, uh, you know, in his temple town and, you know, didn't travel around and see what was going on. He did not have uh, his ear to the ground. So then people took advantage of that and started, you know, pulling away. Um, yeah, so it slowly just imploded. It just overreach and implosion and uh, it, it was kind of sad. The ending was sad. And again, your loyalties that you build will switch, you know, once a new power comes, exactly what the Cholas did to the others, they did to them, you know, the, because the loyalties are just based on your own self-interest. If it doesn't serve you anymore or you feel like you're, it behooves you or suits you better to switch loyalty to somebody else, you do that and uh, that's, that's what happened to them. The new powers, the dynamic was constantly shifting and uh, it, the winds moved away from the, in, the Cholas, the fav favorable winds just went somewhere else. But in a way, these stories still live on, right? We're still talking about them. I mean, we have uh, modern bridges falling every 20, 30 years, but the <laughs> Brihadishwara temple is still Absolutely. There. I mean, it's a marvel, that, that temple. And just it's such a grand story, you know, the, the, the scale in which especially Raja Raja and Rajendra operated, the bigness of their vision, all that is remarkable. Like you said, we're talking about them a thousand years later. They must have done something right, a lot of things right. So yeah, the other fingerprint I thought was worth mentioning is that the dancing Nataraja has become sort of iconic in many ways, right? Like for example, Carl Sagan wrote about it in the yes. context of quantum it's at CERN physics. At, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think it sits outside the CERN, CERN. laboratory yes. entrance and so on. Yeah. So, yeah, they so made it has it, a, yes, it's had its kind of, not its origins, but it's really sort of, uh, for, yes, uh, under, the, under the Cholas. And it's a beautiful, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous form, so. Um, so a lovely book. Would you like to read uh, maybe a portion of it? Sure. Maybe from the prologue or the epilogue okay. or something? Okay, okay. And then we can take questions from the audience as well. Um, so I'll read a little bit from the prologue, which is actually the one part of the book that is kind of sort of made up. It's a fictionalized, an imagined recounting of Raja Raja's coronation. And uh, there are some inscriptions that give some bare details, like what was the, um, the, the month or the star under which the, the, the date, the star date of the coronation. And they said that bugles were blowing and bells and whistles were blowing. There's a lot of you know, celebration and stuff like that. But beyond that, we don't know very much. So I'll just read a couple of paragraphs. Long before sunrise on 18th July, 985, Arul Varman awoke after a restless night. It was the day of his coronation, the culmination of over a quarter of a century of apprenticeship under his father and then his uncle. In the early years of that period, the one destined for the throne, the star that had shone brightest in his father's eyes had been his brother, Aditya Karikala but fate dictated otherwise. Aditya Karikala was murdered, hacked to pieces, and his killers were still at large. Arumuri Varman shuddered when he remembered the day his brutalized body had been found. Almost as bad as seeing his brother in that state was watching the life ebb out of his parents' eyes. They never recovered from the shock. His father had died a broken man, and his mother, unable to bear the thought of living on, had flung herself onto her husband's funeral pyre. Just like that, Arulmuri became an orphan. The day for his coronation had been chosen with special care. It was the month of Karkataka, past the blazing heat of the summer months and before the drenching monsoons set in. It was the day the moon traveled through the, dom through the domain of the twin stars of Punarvasu. Restores, restorers of harmony, heralds of light and goodness, 
emissaries of prosperity, success, and good fortune, these bright stars, nurtured by the mother of all gods, Aditi, would watch over him and ensure a reign that matched their brilliance. That day, the sun rose with extraordinary radiance, casting a golden glow over the land. In the distance, the Kaveri twinkled and sparkled like a sea of diamonds. The dewdrops on the paddy fields glinted before vanishing gently into the limpid air. The streets of Tanjavur, the Chola capital, had been swept to an immaculate spotlessness, perfect canvases for columns of staggering beauty and complexity. That is just one page of the prologue. Thank you. I actually have a couple of questions. Sure. One is, uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, <coughs> you said that in Sri Lanka, Rajaraja is not particularly liked because of uh, his pillage and many other things. On the other hand, you said that some of the villages in Sri Lanka contributed to the building of the temple, and that was seen as a matter of prestige. That there seems to be a kind of contradiction there. Secondly, you've been relying so much on the inscriptions on the temple. Um, there could be problems yes. with that. Mm -hmm. For example, with respect to that um, widowed queen who had so much prestige, you said that she lived through the lives of five emperors. I presume that she was a queen before Rajaraja. Yes. And both Rajaraja and Rajendra didn't have particularly short reigns. So I'm not sure if um, the recounting on the temple walls is accurate, at least from that perspective. OK, I'll answer your both very good points. I'll answer your second one first. Yes, we have to uh, rely on the inscriptions, but the analogy that I give is, imagine that if a thousand years later, you try to recreate a history of all of us through our Instagram accounts or our Facebook accounts, you are going to get a very skewed account. So it's something like that with the Cholas. All we have are the inscriptions, but we also know that those, the way, what those inscriptions said were very much like a public relations effort on their part too. A lot of it was for aggrandization. They needed to validate themselves. So you, can't, you have to take that. You cannot take it at face value. You have to take it with a huge dose of salt. You have to step back and see why are they saying these kind of things. There are many accounts where you know both, say, the Cholas and the Pandyas will claim to have won the same battle. In their inscriptions, the Pandyas will say, we, we won this battle, and we cut off the head of the Chola emperor, and it was lying there on the ground pecked by kites. The Chola emperor is saying the same thing. We, oh, we defeated the Pandya, and we cut off his king, and his head was there cut off by kites. So you, know, you, you kind of are prepared for all that, and uh, you need to also see where the inscription appears. You need to know, understand that uh, there's a lot of hyperbole, a lot of exact, exaggeration, a lot of chest thumping. But, but at the same time, this is all that we have. So I also read the inscriptions of the other, their rival emperors, to hopefully get a kind of a balanced perspective as well. And then try not to just give a literal interpretation saying the inscription says this, therefore this is what happened. Now for your first question, yes, there does, does seem to be a contradiction. He was brutal in Sri Lanka, but, but I also said that many of these were not happy about you know, being under the Chola crown, so he made it, he kind of presented it as a source of prestige. Okay, you give this, uh, uh, you know, donate to this temple and your name will be inscribed on the walls and it'll last as long as the sun and the moon. So there's a lot, lot, of, lot of psychological negotiation that goes on. So, it's not one or the other. Very often, both scenarios that seem contradictory happen simultaneously. Keeping that analogy, you will still write on Twitter even if you don't like Musk, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, hi. That's an awesome discussion and narration. Thank I've you. not yet read the book. But you said you covered the entire Chora from Sangam period to this. By that logic, uh, is the Kalanai, Grand Anikad, 
a greater construct than the temple per se, because that is 700, 800 years prior to the, <laughs> And I have a second question okay. after that. I would say that's like comparing apples and oranges. So the Kalane was a great feat of engineering, no doubt, uh, to you know control the rivers of the Kaveri and uh, uh, you know divert the flow and things like that. And it has lasted this long. You know, for it's nearly two thousand years old. They say so. Uh, and I don't see why we need to compare the two. So we just appreciate each of. Have you commented about the book? I have not read it. I have mentioned, yes, the Kalane has been, uh, the, in the chapter on Karikala, okay. it has definitely been written about. It has also received a facelift recently, the Kalane, so the, some British engineer, I think, kind of uh, modernized it. And there's a chapter on the temple as well. So. Good. And what about the uh, Malacca Strait control that Rajendra Chora had? Yes. I mean, that's one of the fascinating periods of history where India had a Maritime control, isn't it? Absolutely. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons why he launched this massive raid on those kingdoms. One is to kind of teach them a lesson and say, hey, don't go around telling the Chinese that we are nothing. And the second was, was to get control of the Malacca Straits because right. the Sri Vijaya kingdom had control. They had employed some, you know, sea gypsies uh, to kind of uh, catch anybody who came there and basically extort money out of them. So he, he wanted to put an end to all that. And yeah, so it is very, very interesting. The It is, yeah. Behind everything, there is some, there is a strategy, strategic thinking, yes. Last of the points, I mean, uh, unlike the Guptas or the Ashokas who managed to control, did the, ch sorry, unlike the Guptas or the other king, the Mauryas who tried to control the kingdom, did the Choras try to control or did they just go come back? That part, is it written well in history? Because Gangai Kunda Chorapuram was going up to there and fetching and just type of a thing. Uh, uh, did they try to dominate and control? Yeah, what yeah. does the history Definitely. say? Definitely. I mean, they, they did. The parts that they conquered and brought into their fold, they appointed people there, you know, viceroys and generals and stuff to keep control over those regions. So one of their strategies was to employ, I mean, many these kings had many sons, right? So some of the sons would be sent off to those places to kind of keep an eye on it and uh, uh, yeah, maintain control over those places. Definitely, they had to maintain control. They right. couldn't just say, behave yourself and, you know, send your <laughs> money. So uh, yeah, they had to do that. But, but the Ganga thing was... People say he conquered it, but it was he just went there and when came back. It was just back. like a victory march more than a conquering march. Right. But thank you. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Uh, and lovely questions. Yes. Uh, I have two somewhat different. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. 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 So two different uh, questions. One is, clearly there was a lot of fighting going on, but it's also a period, particularly Rajarajan and uh, Rajendran, period of very good governance. Yes. So how did they balance the two? So that's my first question. The other one is not related, so if you'll answer this one first. That, that is a really good question. So the governance had to happen simultaneously, actually. So one followed the other. As soon as, like, when he conquered new territory, for instance, he imposed his system. So Raj, Rajaraja was obsessed with organization, I think. So he had this big land survey. So he continued that into wherever he conquered. He had, he had to have a delicate balancing act between maintaining the existing hierarchy, the existing sort of administration that was in place, that had been in place for a very long time. He couldn't just come and sweep in there and say, you know, get out. So he maintained that, but on top of that, he imposed or superimposed his own people, his own methods of organization and tax collection and a, and a bureaucracy. So he did that simultaneously, actually. So again, we, we can't think of his doing this or the other. He did, he did them both uh, simultaneously. And so I think he was very, very meticulous and very organized, and that helped 
in his reign at least to keep things somewhat stable. And uh, later on, I think the bureaucracy also got very bloated and there was a lot of infighting and things like that. But for these two emperors, it, it kind of stayed relatively calm. And so it was like conquer, consolidate. Yes, conquer, conquer consolidate. consolidate, exactly. My second uh, question is quite different. Uh, it's about the women. Okay. And uh, I mean, I've worked a lot for a long time on empowerment programs. Um, so, you know, if uh, you've probably read Ira Mukoti's uh, book on Daughters of the Sun, Sun yeah. about the Mughal, um, uh, the women in the Mughal Empire, and it talks about the Pacha Begum, and you know, those women were so powerful. They had their own ships, they had their own trade, they had their own incomes. So, these two ladies also, Shambhian Mahadevi and uh, uh, Kuntavai, sound like that. Yes. So, you see some parallels, and of course they were earlier, I think, than the Mughal women. So, do you see some parallels to the nature of the kings? Like Akbar was a very far-sighted emperor. I mean, the kind of men those kings were who allowed, allowed yes. the women to flourish. Do you see any parallels there? Because, you know, you have to be a very secure man to let the women flourish. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a bit of grasping at straws here because what we have is, as I said, the inscriptions. So we have, and you're kind of creating a story out of very sparse bits and pieces of information. But I think Raja Raja was a remarkable man. The fact that, that he said whatever Sembian Mahadevi, any orders she gave would have equal weightage to him and that was inscribed. That spoke of a man with, you know, a, s a sense of, uh, exactly. And also his sister, he held in very high esteem, you know, the sister could be married to some other clan and shipped off there, but she continued to live within the Chola kingdom. And uh, in fact, one of his first inscriptions in the Brihadishwara temple mentions his name, his sister's name, and then a bunch of his wives. So, and then he also brought a bunch of temple women uh, from uh, temples around the kingdom to work at the Brihadishwara temple. And as I said, they were paid well. They were paid on par with the men, which I think speaks for something. I don't know, we are imposing a mind, modern mindset about things. I really don't know how they thought then, but these are the facts that we have. And they were given paddy, they were given prestige land, and the women also auctioned, you know, the conducted auctions to say, because they had this money, they put that money to use, they, they used it to buy property on their name, or they would bargain, they would kind of give money to the temple and said, I want the privilege of, you know, holding the fly whisk or um, standing in front of the procession when it went out and stuff like that. So they did have the rights to do things on their own terms and nobody really stopped them. And uh, this was at its peak during Raja Raja and Rajendra's reign. And you see fewer of such inscriptions, sadly, yes. later on. So, uh, so yes, my yeah. last point. Yes. Um, see, this uh, thing also about how powerful the women were, um, I don't know whether, you know, when we say imposing a modern mindset, it was there. They were there first. We've come later. Yes. So, you know, you turn it around. It's, it's quite fascinating. I mean, it's not like... Even if you look at kings in the West, they have been kings who the queens were as powerful. Yes. So there have been these times in history when it has not quite been 100% patriarchy. True, true. So I mean, human nature is, is the really, same. It, it kind you know, of goes in it, ebbs and it's flows. Worth, it's worth, I think, another book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, nice meeting you, by the way. Thank uh, you. You have to speak closer to the mic. All right. Am I audible? Hopefully. Right. Nice meeting you. No. Thank you. No. <laughs> Talking to the mic. To the mic. Okay. Right. <laughs> all right. So uh, recently I got to travel across uh, Tanjore and uh, visited all this. Uh, speak into the mic. Into the mic. All right. <laughs> is, there, is my height too much of a problem? Is that okay? Thank you. I think I should be audible now. Great, thank you. So I recently got to travel across uh, Tanjore, especially the, the my trip was focused on the living Chola temples, the uh, Perodia temple and Tarasuram, Gangai Kunda Solo Parman, everything. So while I was on the trip, I started, first thought that came to me was like, where did the king live? 
And then I started listening to a lot of uh, folklores around the people and when I was talking to them. So there, somebody mentioned to me that in Tamil, Ko will means, Ko means king, and will means the place he stays. Yes. Mm -hmm. So apparently, Perodia Temple was the place that Raja Raja Soda lived, and the place, uh, the palace, the temple. I don't think we can talk a little louder. I don't think we can talk. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, guys. I look into the mic and talk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how will I look into you? <laughs> right. So, okay, that's scary. So as I was saying that I was uh, listening to a lot of folklores with people where they were saying that the Raja Raja's uh, king themselves lived in the Parodaya temple. Yes. So uh, what do you think about that? Is that true? It, it is true. So unfortunately, we have no, uh, there's no remnants of any palaces. They were built out of bricks and I think other materials that just didn't last. But archaeologists feel, uh, say that both Raja Raja and Rajendra lived within the compound of their respective temples. So there was um, uh, there was a temple inside that compound, and in the Gange Kondachola Puram compound also, they found remnants of bricks, especially around Gange Kondachola Puram. And they said there was so the palace must have been so big that to this day people don't need a bricklin in Gange Kondachola Puram because they've been pilfering those bricks from there and using it for their own own building. So we know also about, they didn't have just one palace, they had multiple palaces scattered throughout the kingdom because again, they couldn't just sit back and say, I've conquered and I'm going to, you know, have a good time. They were constantly on the move. You could never kind of relax. So uh, Raj Raj and Rajendra had multiple palaces around their kingdom and uh, we have inscriptions that talk about it. They'll say he sat, you know, on, on the south side of his palace in such and such a place and he, uh, you know, gave this order or he inscribed this, uh, he gave a grant or something like that. So the, in an indirect way, the, te the, the palaces uh, are mentioned. But there is no remnant of it. They were not built out of stone, unlike uh, the temples. In fact, the earlier temples were all built out of brick. And Shembin Mahadevi was one of the people who had them turned into stone. She realized that the, to make them more permanent, they would. Uh, she she had them remade in stone. She had all the old inscriptions that were there transferred onto the stone temple. Again, a very far-sighted woman, you know. And she also had a note, made a note saying these are the inscriptions that have been transcribed from the old temple to the new temple in order that they will last forever. So, but yeah, the, but to your point, yes. That uh, they did have palaces within the temple complexes as well as other palaces. All right, thank you. That uh, brings me to another question. Sure. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. All right. Uh, so I realized that uh, in the Peruvia temple, uh, towards the right side of the temple, there is a goddess's uh, temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is said that that has been built by a Pandya king. And he contributed to the temple. So any uh, the development of the whole Brihadeshwara temple or the Periyodaya temple, it almost is like every king that comes in, they contribute to it and probably change its name from yes. Periyodaya, Raja Raja Soda, etc., etc., and now Brihadeshwara temple. So when you see it to the present day, uh, you see that when people get into power, they tend to change the names. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so do you think it's something that is somewhere intuitively there that you have to build your power name there. Sorry if it's a difficult question. I guess, again, it's human nature. Everyone wants to make their mark in some fashion. So, you know, yeah, so definitely the Brihadishwara has many sub subsidiary shrines around it that were built much later by the Nayak kings, the Maratha kings. Only there's one shrine, the Chandesha shrine at the back that was the original one of the part of the original structure. So, is it, you're asking if it's good or bad, I don't know. It is what it is. So it's it's what we do. And uh, so sometimes it's done in a very ugly fashion. So, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, we do. so I think that one of the things that we should appreciate about the southern temples, the southern kingdoms, is that they never destroyed the place of worship. And Brihadishwara is the best example because you have the Chola, Pandya, Chola, Pandya. Yes. And then you have the Pallavas, and then you have the Marathas, and you see every uh, you know, remnant of it, which is not something that you see in other states. 
especially when you go to the north or you go to Belur, Halibid, you see the destruction of the temples. Um, talking about the palaces, what I was told is that the battles were so uh, devastating and so uh, tough that the palaces were destroyed. So they didn't care about the palaces or the remnants of whatever that particular kingdom was, but the temples have been preserved. And, and Tanjavur Kumbhakonam is a beautiful example. And I, and I kind of hope, you know, with the movie and with your books, <laughs> that that part of southern India is appreciated, because I don't think that we get enough due in our history and we don't talk about it. Ah, yeah, I agree with you. And yeah. the other thing that I did want to mention is, those of us who've gone to Angkor Wat, you can see Rajendra Chola's, it's the only decent temple. The rest of it is blocks mm -hmm. and got a lot of publicity because thanks to Angelina Jolie. <laughs> but uh, if you see, um, it's just blocks of, uh, and, and I was told um, by the guy there that, um, you know, they lost the art of sculpting after Rajendra Chola. They came in with Rajendra Chola uh, and built, that's a 7th century, 9th century temple. And after that, everything is just, you know, blocks of stone um, and, and, and put over it. So um, it's something that we should be proud of. And, and you see it all over, both mm -hmm. in Cambodia, you see it in Thailand. And so I know, you know, you haven't talked enough about it, but there was a huge impact that Rajendra Chola and Raja Raja did Absolutely. in terms of... Yeah. Yeah. So Culturally, point. they had a massive yeah. impact. And the Pallavas too before them, yeah. so yeah. in Southeast Asia. Yeah. So thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah. First of all, uh, thank you for bringing out this book. The question I had was about the script that was used in those temples and outside walls. I don't think it was the modern Tamil script. It was much before. It was, and yeah. you'd make a mention, I think you did mention that uh, it was lost for a period of time till it was translated. Yes. So I was wondering what was the development that took place in translating it. And the related question is that I've been to these uh, two temples. Uh, how much of that is actually there in that temple itself, and how much had to be, what I would call, fill in the blanks, perhaps. OK, so the script was called Grantha script. It yeah. was called the Pallava Grantha script that it was written in. And some of the inscriptions, especially on copper plate, were in both Sanskrit and Tamil. So the Tamil was a, they call it the Tamil script. But it is different from that. It is like a proto-Tamil. Uh, it was still a developing script. And it is some letters you'll recognize from today's Tamil, some, some you will not. And the Grantha script is, again, a South Indian script that was used to write the Sanskrit portion of the grant. And I think as the script evolved, see, the common man was not able to read those inscriptions. I think they had only certain highly educated people were able to read. The script must have evolved and changed and gone on. and. It was in the 1900s that Indian epigraphy kind of became a, a field, and it really exploded at that time. So there were two people, one called uh, Rao Bahadur Venkaya and a German called Hulch, who went to Brihadishwara, and I guess they were scholars of the language. They took etchings of everything, you know, and there are miles of inscriptions that are there. The Cholas were prolific inscribers, you know, both in quantity as well as their quality of the inscriptions. That's that's another reason why they're, they're so amazing. So they deciphered, managed to decipher the script. And I have not read that story in detail yet. But it was they who kind of told the world that it was Raja Raja. Because Raja Raja has written in the Sanctum Santorum that I, Ko Raja Kesari Varman, you know, built this temple and I'm donating such and such and such and such a thing to the temple and so they deciphered that and told the world that it is these, this king who built this temple. Even a few centuries before that, in the Nayak era, 17th century, or in the 1800s or so, there was a British uh, manual of Tanjavur. They used to have these imperial gazettes or whatever it is. One was published in the 1800s that mentions of, of Tanjavur district that mentions the Brihadishwara temple. But it doesn't say Raja Raja. They said, we think it was built by a king called Kulotanga or some other name. And I found that amazing. I said, just in a few centuries, poor guy, he's done all this work and his name is forgotten. But uh, it is the epigraphists who kind of uh, made that information available to us today. And uh, so a lot of it is on walls. Um, to answer your second question, and there are lots of gaps, you know, some, sometimes the walls have chipped off, these are thousand year old walls, so it's kind of a little bit of guesswork has to be done too, to kind of fill in the blanks. You briefly mentioned about copper plates as well. Yeah. Uh, are there enough of that kind of around as well? 
he's asking about the copper, copper plates. plates copper plates there are some there are several uh, there's one in a university in in the netherlands in leiden there are couple in in chennai in in the museum in chennai so the, the, there many of them were dug underground you know when and uh, when the islamic invasions came into southern india many of the idols and copper plate things were just buried underground for safe keeping and then they were forgotten about because it it was many years before you know uh, that that period of history uh, ended and then they're still digging up stuff to this day actually the idols and things yeah some of my uh, points that i wanted to say <laughs> okay uh, i've lived uh, uh, and traveled in the far east and i just wanted to know whether you've covered uh, that part of influence of uh, these kingdoms in the far east uh, just, just i'll just give sure. you a uh, she talked about angkor wat mm -hmm. there's a museum in uh, nom pen which is really worth visiting we'll get to learn about india more because we've got whitewashed in some parts our history uh, but there it's kind of uh, undiluted as such um, and the kingdoms actually you talked about sri vijaya empire um, what is the relationship with uh, you know the cholas or whatever indian connection um, there is you know if you go to the philippines there is uh, the archipelago part of the archipelago is the lesser visayas and the greater visayas is actually visaya is a, is a is basically sri vijaya yeah? c c visaya that, that's how the filipinos uh, say it you know it's basically a corruption of sri vijaya so the influence was right down to the south pacific um, where the philippines kind of gets into um, so my point is have you covered anything in the book of uh, any research in that area the those those uh, civilizations actually give you a lot more leads you know um not too much to answer your question uh, it's kind of covered peripherally with respect to the trade relations between the cholas and um and those kingdoms and actually angkor wat i would say the influence is more from the pallava kingdom a little bit earlier than than the cholas the cholas were much more involved with the sri vijaya kingdom they were involved with china so that was not the focus of my book so the focus was more centered in chola india and wherever they went out but there is a little bit of mention of that and uh, uh, in china also there is a shiva temple that was built sri lanka has a shiva temple but i don't go into detail about from their their end how uh, the cholas kind of influence their culture that, that there's not too much on that it's just a mention i would say so what's that book number 2 <laughs> yeah unfortunately my question was the same what he asked it was primarily the spread of the hindu culture or the influence can it be primarily attributed to rajendra chola's assault on sri vijaya kingdom or there were other factors kingdoms too as i said it started with the pallavas were uh, who were there from the say 6th 7th century so a couple of centuries before the cholas were a big maritime uh, power too so they were in fact the first ones from southern india going you know to the southeast asia so i think a lot of the influence came from them and it was like a soft power you know like uh, along with the traders they would take their priests with them so it was uh, the the development of that culture was not forced on them but it kind of it was a very nice kind of uh, absorption of whatever the culture and the rituals but no i have not covered any of that and as devi said maybe that's book number 2 as much as whatever is here i can write there are about three books worth of information that is not here that you have to stop somewhere and you know wrap up so uh, good evening uh, my name is vinay Uh, my question to you madam is on the uh, contemporary importance uh, of the cholas and specifically of raja raja the first by by contemporary importance i mean if you look at the others like the marathas and shivaji there are airports and highways <laughs> the moguls in north india in delhi so we know their standing in the contemporary times so where is the raja raja first international airport <laughs> where is the rajendra chola highway between oh. bengaluru and mysuru what does that tell us about the importance given in contemporary yeah, times yeah. your book talks about him being the uh, 
uh, you know, king of kings. So the reflection of that in, today, in today's times is, so what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so that's a very good point. Unfortunately, he exists in movies in this Pony and Selwyn. <laughs> you know, he's very much a part of popular culture in... in uh, launched a, a range of jewelry called Chola jewelry. That's right. Like yeah. the season, I think. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it says something about our priorities. <laughs> in yes. So the Chola jewelry, I have no idea what it has to do with Cholas. The Chola saris that, you know, have like little Raja Raja Cholas and little Brihadishwara temple, quite hideous. So that is there. But yeah, there is no Raj Raja airport. Can and share a point on this? Sure. Yes. Uh, in 2014 or 2015, commemorating Raj, because he was a naval conqueror. Yes. Okay. And uh, when Indian Navy's uh, uh, the monogram was changed, there was a debate: should they go for the Marathas uh, coastline that was done recently, or should it be the Chora? Okay. Jersey? There was a debate, but uh, maybe the political consideration went to Maratha. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's also, I mean, you asked, that was one of your earlier questions, why did I write this book? I feel there's just not enough. I mean, he was such a great king who's done so many amazing things, so far-sighted, but so little is known about him, or he's caricatured, you know, so into, again, like this is jewelry and the sari and things like that, so it's, I feel there's not enough respect given to that. So few people have gone to Tanjavur, Gange Kunda Cholapuram, these are amazing uh, pieces of architecture, and it's an amazing history, so hopefully the tide is changing. Sure. Uh, what he just mentioned about uh, Rajendra Chola. I don't know if you know, but uh, the Merchant uh, Navy, uh, that is called uh, DMET, Directorate of Marine Engineering Training, right? Uh, and uh, part of that is TS Rajendra, Training Ship Rajendra. Wow, okay. Good, good. Yeah, but that is not like widespread. I didn't know about this, so it's not like... <laughs> so, so thank you. We'll take two more questions. Hello. Uh, my question is related to the challenges you faced dealing with sources while putting this book together. Could you throw some light on the, on the, the three most challenging ones that, that you dealt with and what, what sort of things did you grapple with? I'm interested in that. And that's very good. I mean, it, it was very, very challenging. I mean, somebody had asked the question about the inscriptions, which is a large, I mean, that is your, your direct source from the Cholas. First of all, they're very, very boring, a lot of it. It's like very densely detailed how many sheep somebody gave, some, how many elephants somebody gave, how many lamps, how much of butter. But in, in embedded, in all, embedded in all that are little nuggets that give you uh, like more, better information. But I had to be constantly aware that, you know, this is the cholas, what they have to say about themselves. So how to balance that out? And again, I am not a trained historian, so I did rely on other people's interpretations. I read a lot. There's a lot of controversy about how Raja Raja organized his empire, for instance. You know, so one historian will say it was properly, meticulously organized. It was a great bureaucracy. The other one says, no, 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 it was just, his only, his immediate surroundings were organized. Everything else was just like a ragtag collection of things. So what to believe? But in the end, you realize that you're all, you're grasping at straws. Everybody is trying to interpret it the best they can. So I try not to say, present it as like, this is it, but just present also different points of view. Um, the other challenges were, you know, what to include. There, there's so many questions that have not been answered in the book, you know, so what to include, what not to include. So I, I just had to come to a standstill, a stop at some point and say, okay, this is a lay person's history. What I basically wrote what interested me, you know, so uh, I had to leave just out a lot just of a stuff. Just follow up to that. Yeah. Um, he had battles with other kingdoms like yes. the Kalingas, the yes. Chalukyas, and all of that. So, did you have a chance to look at sources in those languages? Absolutely, absolutely. But fortunately, and I don't read any of the other languages, 
the epigraphical uh, or the archaeological survey of India has these volumes called the Epigraphia Indica. They are remarkable. I mean, those, those were a godsend for me because these were done again from the 1800s and they're con probably continuing to be written to this day. They are a joy to read because they have been translated, transliterated, so you can, if you know, I mean, I'm, I'm Tamil, so you can kind of read it out aloud in the English script, in Kannada, in whatever language. So if you have a basic understanding, you can kind of understand that, but also translated beautifully into English with commentary, with annotation. So all that is available for free online. So I, that, that uh, and uh, definitely I read accounts from many other kingdoms, because you can't believe what one side is saying. You, you kind of get a full picture and try to see, you know, what makes sense. And, In awe when we look at these temples and uh, uh, palaces, the grandeur yes. in which they lived, the lifestyle of kings, etc. Anything about the common man, how he lived, and any per capita income? In today's terms, we call it per capita income. <laughs> Not much, unfortunately. As they say, history is written by the victors. So the victors here were the kings. But we do have a little bit into the non royal life, which is the life of the traders. So the traders themselves had their own sort of structure. They had their guilds, their own villages in which they lived, in which they you know, had their elections and things like that. Uh, they inscribed on the walls of their temples. So you get an insight into the lives of those people. And again, as you asked an earlier question about the de democracy in the villages. So you get an idea of village life. You know, who, what are the different kinds of professions that people had? What were the kind of crimes that were considered unworthy of you know being elected so it's nothing direct but through these kind of uh, indirect means there is a little bit of, of that so common man his life and lifestyle nothing no so this, that's that's what i said so they they traded they yeah they, some of the rituals that they followed so but nothing I mean, they were not allowed to uh, you know tell their story the way the king told his his story if if at all you hear from them it is that i donated a lamp to this temple and uh, you you'll have a little bit about the, about their background but not about their life or how they lived or anything so Uh, I'm not really comfortable speaking much in public, so I'll try to frame the question. So, yeah. Uh, so bear with me as I frame the question. So since you, a lot of people who were focusing on the temples and temples as you, you said are political statements when they're built, also when they're destroyed, uh, or rather, actually this is what was a little uncomfortable, uh, something that I read recently. Uh, this book called Pers Indian Persianate Age by this guy called Eaton. Okay. In fact, I think... Richard Eaton. Ha, Richard Eaton. Okay. So, in fact, he was sort of uh, rephrasing what Romila Thapar also has been saying. For, uh, for instance, Somnath Temple destructions by Ghaznis were around the same time. Uh, I think it's Raj Raj Chola, right, as he was marching northeast. Uh, was he destroying temples along the way? And were these political statements? Was he bringing back anything? So this has been a very uncomfortable kind of uh, reading for me because we grew up with this understanding which is very distinct from this whole statement that's been made. There was looting from temples, definitely. So he destroyed, in fact, the Buddhist Vihara, so that's a different religion. Apparently he just raised them to the ground and looted everything. Those stupas carried a lot of wealth. People, uh, they stored a lot of you know, precious jewelry, gold and things. So he took all of that and brought it. So he was not above uh, destroying places of worship. And there are instances of other kings who've taken stuff from other temples, like uh, the, the Chalukyas, the Kalyanapura, their, their capital. They've taken a few Id images and stuff like that and then installed it in their own temples later on. To again, to say, see, this, we have taken this from your temple and we put it in our temple. So it's a kind of a passive aggressive way of doing it. They would inscribe on, uh, on the other person's temple to say that I'm now in charge of this temple. So, but they don't actually talk about destroying temples. But I don't know why we're hung up on temples. They did other ghastly things. I mean, they raped women, they killed children, they cut off heads. So why is, they were brutal at that time that that was how they functioned. So uh, I think because, it was, anyway, so. Uh, but they, I don't know whether Raja Raja was aware of what was going on in Somnath. So, uh, there's I, I no mention. Up to that, since yeah. you spent so much time on the epigraphy. 
it does it dis, uh, does it uh, very openly uh, proscribe uh, bigotry of any sort against other faiths because obviously he, uh, you mentioned viharas yeah so no he doesn't say anything about you're saying does he say make derogatory statements about other religions other faiths no because raj raja uh, you know they were also practical and strategic he kind of en endowed an entire village to a buddhist vihara for the upkeep of a buddhist vihara because it was a strategic move so he yes he helped he built um, he supported vaishnavite temples his sister supported so i think again imposing our, our thinking and our way of our ideals and our principles on on that era is it, it it's, it doesn't make sense. I don't think it gives us an insight into them at all. So it's, it can be misleading, and I don't go into that at all. It makes me uncomfortable too. So you know, what we don't know, I'm not going to make <laughs> guesses about. So. Okay. Thank you so much. I think. Uh, okay. Kamini, do we you just have, have a few to... photographs that I'd like to share. So this is stunning. So this is what Raja Raja built. That is the the Vimanam. I guess. Yeah. It's over 200 feet tall, and there's this capstone on top that is mistakenly believed to be a single stone. It's actually about six stones cemented together. So, uh, so this is another close-up of the Vimanam. And uh, this whole thing was made out of granite, which is not a material found in the immediate vicinity of Tanjavur. So, they're not sure where it came from or how it was brought there. There's one theory that it was brought in coracles up the Kaveri River. And there's another theory that it was brought on the backs of elephants from about 50, 60 kilometers away. Uh, these are the Gopurams or entrance gateways into uh, the Brihadeshwara temple. Uh, the one was called the uh, the Kerala Antaka Gate after he uh, captured or conquered Kerala, and the other one was called the Raja Raja Tiruvasal, named after himself. So, and this is the Nandi Mandapam that was actually built in later times, of several centuries later, I think in the 1700s or so, by the Nayaks. There's a massive Nandi there, but this is not from Raja Raja's time. So this is just, I mean, somebody asked about the script. So an example of uh, uh, the carvings on, on, on the walls of Brihadishwara. So some of it you can, those who can read Tamil can they see this is a pa, this is a na. Some of it is familiar, some of it is not. So this is an earlier version of, of Tamil. This is actually the Chidambaram temple the Nataraja temple, which was a very holy site for the Cholas. And again, the Cholas like to tell stories and lots of mythologies that link them to this temple. And the main god here is Nataraja, which became their main, their, their favorite deity. So many Chola kings, um, I mean, this is a very, very, very old temple, but many Chola kings contributed to the growth of this temple. It started out as a very small thing and it's a massive, massive complex now. A large portion of it done post Raj Raja, but it's beautiful. Uh, this is at uh, Dharasuram. This is a later Chola temple, one of the great living temples. And you see a new form, this, this chariot uh, kind of structure that is, they feel, uh, from Chalukya uh, inspired design. And they say that the Sun Temple at Konarak later on that came a few, uh, maybe a century or two later, took its inspiration from here. This is actually a much earlier Chola temple, so one of the earlier Chola rulers. So this is what the Chola temples looked like, you know, they were very small, single storied structures made out of stone. Even these will have inscriptions, you barely have, you know, uh, anything, sculptures along the niches. So when Sendian Mahadevi came along, she added a lot of niches along these walls into which she uh, had carved different forms of Shiva, particularly Nataraja. So this is one of the earliest Chola temples we have from the 9th century. Uh, this is at Gange Konda Chola Puram, I think. It's Ardhana Rishwara, Shiva as half man, half woman. So. 
Uh, this is the female side, and this is the male side. It's, it's, it's really beautiful. This is the Gange Kanta Chalapuram temple built by Rajaraja's son Rajendra. Also really beautiful. It's a kind of a gentler, more feminine version, they say. Uh, you know, the Gopuram is it's like it's shorter and it's got a gentler curve. Another view, again the Nandi I think came later. These are all maintained by the Archaeological Survey of India and they've done a great job. Here is a magnificent Nataraja from probably between Sambhin Mahadevi and Rajaraja's time, so 10th, 10th century. And this is the extent of Rajaraja's empire. It's, it's a map so that shows you what all he conquered. So this, this is the line. And uh, you know this is all the Deccan Plateau, the Tungabhadra, where the humpy Vijayanagar empire was. This is Vengi in present-day Andhra Pradesh. All this, this area used to belong to the Pallavas. This was the Chola sort of uh, heartland. This is the Pandya heartland, but all of this came under Rajaraja's uh, rule. And then part of Sri Lanka also. Just, he, he was never able to conquer the southern part. It was very wild and unruly and uh, difficult to get a hold of. But uh, Anuradhapura was the old Ceylon capital that he destroyed. And they made the new capital here at Polonuruva, where he built a temple that stands to this day. This is one of the copper plate grants that was actually built by, sorry, made by Rajendra Chola called the Tiruvallangadu plates. So this is a museum at, at Madras. So they're like, it must weigh tons and tons and tons and tons. So this is, this is like the Chola seal with, this is supposed to be a tiger. It looks like a rat, but anyway, the two fishes were actually Pandya emblems. So this is to show that we conquered the Pandyas and it's a massive, massive seal holding together these copper plates that are basically, it's like a legal document talking of a grant of a village to, uh, to the, for the upkeep of a village to a particular temple. And here is another Nataraja. This is how he's dressed up for procession. So the processional idols were richly dressed up, beautiful clothes, they would be adorned with flowers, with, you know, kungumam, with uh, sand sandalwood richly dressed with silks and they were a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sight. And when they were taken out in procession, anybody and everybody could worship them. So it didn't matter what caste or how rich or how elite or what, how non-elite you were. Many people were not allowed into the temple, but they could worship these kind of uh, processional idols. And uh, that's that. So I just thought I'd share these with you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our speaker and our interlocutor. Thanks.